While I was visiting the Hori Cancha Temple in Cusco, Peru, I wanted to try a mental exercise inspired by the Hechua concept of pacha as a phenomenon that they used to explain time as something that could be passed through both temporal and spatial dimensions. And one of the metaphors that they used was likening the movement into the future with your back facing it, because you could not see what was coming ahead, and yet you could see with clarity the things that have already happened. And so I wanted to try this out with the, the solar shrine toward the southern end of the Hori Kacha Temple, which is now situated in the center of the historical uh, Cusco district. Pacha is a complex term found among the Quechua languages of Western South America. And in its most literal sense, Pacha is a four-dimensional reckoning of space-time. That is a concept that situates the speaker in both the temporal and spatial aspects of reality. It is about both when and where you are in the world. And it can be further clarified by using a rich set of vocabulary terms to specify in what particular way Pacha is meant to be conveyed. So there were ways in which Pacha could be specified as a spatial term, but there were also other ways using similar spatial reckoning to describe Pacha in a temporal sense. There were ways of talking about Pacha in time by using terms related to space and orientation. The Hechua languages use three specific terms in order to talk about pacha in spatial senses, and they were as follows. Hanan pacha, referring to the worlds above, the sky, the heavens, and the things among them. Kai pacha, which was literally this pacha, the pacha of here and now, the, the, the people and the inhabitants of the surface of the earth. And then uku pacha, which can mean both uh, under and inner world. And I'll return to this when we look at today's mask. An interesting thing about Pacha is that even though Quechua speakers use it to talk about time, they often do so by describing it with spatial and orientation terms. And there are two that especially come to mind. Those are Jepa and Nyaupa. We saw an example of Jepa in the exercise that I, uh, by which I began this video, and that was uh, Jepa meaning the behind. So I was walking backward with my back facing the future, which is a way of saying that I could not see what was forthcoming, but I could only move in that direction in order to move in the direction of the future. That is to follow the natural flow of time by as if I were also at the same moment moving through space in a particular direction. What the video at Hori Kancha also sought to illustrate is that what has already happened could be seen with clarity, as if you were facing what has already happened by having your eyes looking directly at it. And the Quechua languages use the term nyaupa in order to describe this phenomenon, this experience of seeing with clarity what has already happened because you are walking backward as you are walking toward the future, but you are also at the same time seeing what has already happened. And so nyaupa refers to the eye, the face, whereas the jepa is a way of you talking about the back as the uh, part of your body that is facing the unforeseeable future. This image is one of the most well-known and iconic representations of the Inca cosmos. It comes from a manuscript that was written in the year 1613 AD. And what comes out from this image is the layering, the organization of the cosmos in a vertical setting, beginning with the uppermost figures, such as the sun and the moon, then following with the morning and evening stars, and then meteorological phenomena and the seasons. This image therefore represents the three categories of pacha as space, beginning with the Hanan pacha of above, and then the Kai Pacha of the here, that is the surface of the earth, and finally the Uku Pacha of the world below. Also pay attention to the pairing of these complement elements. We began with the sun and the moon, the morning and evening star. We, there are also elements such as the summer and winter, and then when we reach the surface of the earth, the couple of the human pair, that namely as man and woman. Notice how this image consistently presents nature as something that occurs in pairs, in duality. And this relates to the Inca concept of Yanantin, which is so important that I'd like to address this in another video ahead. But at least for now, through this image, we may appreciate the ways in which Pacha is portrayed through the dimension of space.
Today's mask comes from the Aymara of Bolivia, and it was used during the performance of the Cusillo dances, or the dances of the fool, the buffoon. The Aymara performed the Cusillo dance in order to ritually promote fertility for the earth. One of the more interesting symbols that we find on this mask is the long protruding nose, which could be seen as a phallic symbol that strengthens the fertility aspects of this figure. Other versions of the Cusillo mask include devil horns, which reinforce the underworldly and supernatural aspects of this figure. Unlike in Western Christianity, the devil in indigenous traditions is not an inherently malevolent or evil being. From the example of the colonial period illustration, we saw that Yanantin, the duality of the cosmos, was a guiding principle in Inca philosophy. And indeed, duality pervaded every level of the cosmos. Not only were humans expected to act in accordance with the balance between dual forces, but the gods and the spirits themselves were also expected to behave in such manners. So that when the indigenous peoples adopted the Christian saints and devils and other divinities into their worldview, these figures also became dual in nature. This is a very important topic for understanding contemporary indigenous practices, and so I'd like to dedicate another video toward explaining this further. But for now, this mask returns us to the subject of Pacha, and to do this, I'd like to now talk about an example from the Quechua of Ecuador, where they have traditional mask dances that are called the Aya Uma or the Diablo Uma, literally meaning the head of the spirit or the head of the devil. And in the Ecuadorian customs, the devil, again, is not an inherently evil force, but is seen as a figure that represents the internal life force of the human being, as well as a symbol for the life force that permeates the cosmos, that permeates nature. I was originally confused over the term ukubi because I found that it could mean either within or below, depending on context. And then as I started to reflect on the celebration of the Aya Uma, or the Diablo Uma, among the Quechua of Ecuador, I realized that this too could relate to the life force that existed within the person, also the life force that existed in the universe beyond. So likewise, in today's Quechua world, these masked dances represent the spiritual forces and the vitalizing energies that could exist both within the human body as well as coming from beneath the earth. To recap, Pacha is a complex term in the Quechua language because it can be used in many different ways to explain the spatial and temporal dimensions of our presence in the world. In many contemporary Quechua languages, the term Pacha can also be used to describe the world itself. And we find this, for example, in the Quechua of Ecuador, where Pacha may be used to connote weather, time, season, the world, or the, just nature as a general term. This Quechua model of the universe extended into many directions, such as upward into Hanan Pacha, resting here in the Kai Pacha, and descending below into the Uku Pacha, as well as the temporal directionalities of the then, the now, and the forthcoming. Even time itself as an aspect of Pacha could be explained in spatial terms. Grammatical details attached to the term Pacha give Quechua speakers powerful ways to describe the when and where of their place in the world, as well as how they may act in it. Thank you for watching, and good roads.